Okay, so I'd like to talk a little bit about what we and, and others are calling uh, systemic resilience of the barrier reef. And um, I think it's fair to say we're, we're all acutely aware of the damaging impacts that the reef has experienced over, over many years, and of course most acutely in the recent past. But I think there's been a number of studies that have, have tried to explain the net decline in reef state, primarily on the things that we know cause damage. So the usual suspects of cranothorn starfish, cyclones, and bleaching. And of course, you know, as you might expect, that's not going to be the whole story. And one of the things we've been looking at is what happens during those periods between those successive events? What happens during the recovery phase? And so, of course, you have a series of uh, perturbations, and then these are separated by periods of recovery. And the question we wanted to ask was, well, what's happening to that recovery trajectory over time? Um, I think we certainly have tended to assume that recovery is something that just happens, and, uh, and it's not necessarily changing. And so to do this, uh, we work closely with our colleagues at Ames and using the Ames long-term monitoring data set for the mid and outer shelf reefs. And we separated those periods of recovery from the periods of disturbance and then asked, what, what are the trends? Okay. And what we found uh, really surprised us in the first instance in that recovery rate since 1992 has been declining. Um, it's been declining quite dramatically. Uh, the average rate of decline is 80% thereabouts. Now, some reefs are showing no signs of changing and others are showing quite dramatic changes. So if we plot um, instantaneous growth rate over time for a variety of different coral groups, we're seeing the same overall trend, one of decline. And it's very patchy. If you look at a map of the sites, of course, there's only around 90 sites, which is a you know, huge effort on the part of the monitoring team, but it's still only a small fraction of the reefs on the GBR. There's very little sort of sense to the pattern when you look at it in terms of which reefs are the ones that are slowing down, which reefs are not. And it's quite a challenge to figure out what's actually going on here. And so we started off with the usual approach of just looking at some statistical associations and we you know, include some things like time and space, initial cover as our base model. And then the sort of most striking associations that we could find, the greatest association we could find, which explains around about 20% of the variance, is river flow. The amount of, 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 of flow that's coming out during that period of recovery. Those periods of recovery where there is more water coming out of the, of the coastline are associated with even lower rates of recovery. Now, we don't, of course, know what element of water quality is driving that precisely. And one of the challenges is that in order to have a data set that goes all the way back to 1992, um, that limits your options because there's very good quality modeling now through e-reefs of, of many of the biogeochemical processes. We just can't take that back in time yet. The other thing that we found that was, was interesting is this sort of legacy of disturbance. So particularly if you've had an exceptionally powerful cyclone, then the recovery period that follows that is slower, even accounting for any changes in lower coral cover, than that that you would expect from a weaker cyclone. And again, we don't know what the mechanism is. Potentially, it could be associated with greater fragmentation of corals and a difference in the stability of the rubble and how long it takes that rubble to consolidate before recovery can really start taking place. We don't really know. A similar story was found with the bleaching intensities. So when we saw these results, we really doubted it. We thought, you know, we must have done something wrong here. There's something wrong. We, how could you possibly have that kind of average uh, decline in recovery rate, despite the fact it's very patchy in some places, as I said, are, have been doing just fine. And so we did a variety of things. We, we first of all sort of brainstormed, well, what are the things that we could imagine that might explain this that would essentially become art be artifacts? And we went through a list of, of possible things like, are recovery times getting shorter over time? Um, you know, there's been new sites added over time. Do they have different properties from the older sites? Changes in methodology and so forth. And we couldn't, we, we tested each of these and we couldn't find any evidence that they were in play. And the other thing we did was use 
some of our ecological simulation models of the reef and say, well, what do we already know about the sort of uh, chronic stresses that are affecting reefs, including suppression of recruitment as you've got low population densities, uh, chronic effects of water quality on partial mortality, on fertility, on growth rate. And when you combine these chronic stresses, you can indeed generate an 80% reduction in overall recovery rate. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that the way we've combined them is the actual way things are happening. It just shows that, well, maybe we shouldn't be quite as surprised as we were but it's a bit depressing. Now, the other thing we, we see is that before the recent bleaching events, some areas of the reef had shown really profound rates of recovery in the data set. And again, we can recreate those recovery periods because these tended to be in areas that were a little more remote from the flooding effects and also hadn't had a recent um, history of major disturbance. Um, and also, you know, one of the implications is that if we have just been through a period of exceptionally turbulent de disturbance, by which I'm really referring to the cyclones, because we know that cyclones um, occur in patches. You get a period of time, maybe five to 10 years, where you have quite high intensity of cyclones on much of the reef. And then that's followed by a quieter period, then a cluster, then a quieter period. We've, we've documented that in the past. So possibly some of these things could be in play. It's an open field. So, of course, what it means is that some of these patterns of net reef decline that we see are a combination of all of these factors, of course. It's the combinations of major disturbances, which are, of course, hugely important, as well as a slow recovery capacity. And um, it's very variable. It's, it's hard to explain at this point. But, you know, we do have some some statistical association that water quality is, is playing a role in this in some way, and these legacy effects. Um, and of course, this underlies the importance of looking at recovery and studying recruitment as people, as people do. So this then led us to sort of thinking about well, what are the processes of recovery on the reef at a large scale? Is there some sort of uh, system-wide mechanism that might facilitate recovery? And so we did some work on that, just really focusing on the question of larval dispersal and connectivity. And we started off by looking at models of coral larval dispersal across the reef. This is using the same models that underpin e-reefs. This is CONI2. And running, um, simulating coral spawning events up and down the reef for a number of years and, and looking at the properties. And the first thing we wanted to do was identify what we're describing as sort of, sort of key source nodes or robust sources of replenishment. So what that would look like would be a reef that has a number of desirable criteria. One would be that the reef is strongly connected to lots of other reefs downstream. So it actually is an important source, potentially. But of course, many of those links from one reef to another are ephemeral. It's a very uh, variable, stochastic process. So we then wanted to focus on just the persistent links, the ones that we think are, are most likely to be robust. And we run this for a variety of life history um, parameters associated with coral. And we prioritise connections where the reef itself is connected downstream to a reef that is also connected to many other reefs. So you maximise the potential for a sort of cascading recruitment effect. Now, when we did this, we found about 550 reefs that met these criteria. That's 14% of the reefs as we know them. And, you know, these are found mostly throughout the entire system with a curious exception around Townsville. Um, I ain't saying anything. And, um, you know, but what, this gives you some sort of nuggets to work with in a, in a management context. Now, we then went a little further and said, well, given the, the bleaching histories, um, it's all very well to have a reef that can act as a great larval source, but if it's just been knocked out by a bleaching event, um, there's nothing much to supply. So, um, oh, sorry, just to mention in passing that some work we're doing with colleagues looking at the genetic patterns in corals are showing quite good agreement with some of these predictions. So then if you sort of filter out those reefs that have um, never been exposed to the sorts of bleaching that causes mass mortality, that has a huge effect on the number of reefs you would select. Now, this is admittedly a very draconian step to take out any reef that's ever experienced major mortality has a huge effect, and that's a lot stronger than you would actually need. Because, of course, in any one event, only a fraction of those reefs are really affected. 
When you do that, um, we find then a subset of reefs, and then we added a third criteria, and that is you want these reefs to be good sources of coral connectivity, but you don't really want them to be uh, a key part of the crown of thorn starfish um, outbreak uh, system. So we then knocked out reefs that were important in the crown of thorn starfish uh, epidemics. So when we do all of that, you get this sort of slightly depressing looking picture of 112 reefs thereabouts, which is 3% of the reefs on the GBR. And what you can see, of course, is that it's really patchy. A lot of them are down in the south um, and few further north and in the center. But one of the remarkable things, I, for me at least, was that of those 3% of reefs, that they have the potential to be connected and provide larvae to almost half of the reefs during a single summer spawning event. Um, and this is sort of relevant in the context of bleaching, where um, because of the large amount of coral mortality, the importance of local retention of larvae is going to be much less than would normally be the case. And reefs will be more dependent, in principle anyway, on larvae coming from intact reefs elsewhere. And that's when this is really what you're trying to model in this context. So there is actually a lot of potential for uh, reefs to connect to one another after bleaching events. And of course, the, the, the processes driving this aren't accidental. It's mostly an oceanography story in that many of these reefs are found on the outer shelf where you have often cooler water coming in from the coral sea. The reason that that water is cooler is why that you often find that the areas which have a lower risk of bleaching tend to be in those sites. It also has the directionality going from east to west that often makes them a good larval source. And um, the fact that they don't have an upstream crown of thorns starfish population also helps them be selected. So what does all this mean? Well, it tells us that 14% of reefs are much more important than others, it seems, in terms of their ability to act as coral larval sources. Um, and, you know, it. it it really highlights the fact that some reefs are going to be more important in this story than others. You can then subset that out further and just look at those that are less likely to experience bleaching in crown of thorn starfish, and then that gives you a pretty small number of reefs. But it does suggest that there is scope for some of the less threatened reefs to start playing a role in kickstarting recovery, which we loosely talk about as meaning there is some systemic resilience to that system. Of course, there's concern over the major gaps in the central and northern parts of the reef, but there is still this very high level of connectivity. And in fact, I think one of the reasons, and we've published this in some previous work that Carlo Hock led, one of the reasons that crown of thorn starfish are such a problem on the Barrier Reef is because the reef is so strongly connected. And um, the area where cots tend to first occur, sort of in the wet tropics, is an area that is extremely well connected to the rest of the system. And so, you know, in some respects, that high connectivity is an Achilles heel for the reef in terms of crown of thorn starfish. But perhaps in other contexts, it can help kickstart coral recolonization. <laughs> and overall, to me, the, the take home message from this is that it highlights the great heterogeneity in reef function. And, you know, this is something that management can capitalize on for approaches such as resilience-based management, trying to work with the system to protect important sources in a, in a dynamic way. So you can imagine that if you've got a bunch of reefs that have been damaged at some given time, you say these reefs are damaged, where are the larval sources to those reefs that are still in a good state? You can then go to this sort of 500 or so reefs and say, well, which ones of these are still in a good state? And then maybe act to protect them further, whether that's through crown of thorn starfish or what have you. Okay, so to conclude, we cannot take coral reef recovery for granted. Water quality seems to have some influence, but the mechanism isn't clear. One conservation about water quality being identified as a factor is that that at least is under partial control of management. Obviously, it's likely that the chronic cumulative stresses are a, a cocktail of causes, and those causes will vary from place to place. There's no single recipe that's causing this, um, and we need to understand that. But we don't need to wait uh, until we do understand it before we take more action to manage the system. Unfortunately, some of these legacy effects, such as cyclone strength uh, and intensity of bleaching, are likely to worsen. So this is obviously a significant concern. <coughs> 
And I think I'd say that you know, systemic resilience is an emerging field, and you know, it does generate this kind of glass half full versus glass half empty kind of perspective. And you know, I, sometimes I talk about this and I sound almost like, well, I sound optimistic, and sometimes I sound pessimistic. And you know, some people said to me, wow, only 3% of reefs reach these criteria. And I guess when I thought about it, I said, well, when we started this, we had no preconceived notion that any reef should show all of these criteria. There should be a good larval source, there should be relatively low risk of bleaching and out of the way of crown-of-thorn starfish. And this is a young uh, type of study of systems, and I think it's not until we have studied these sorts of processes across a variety of systems will we know whether, in fact, the Great Barrier Reef is unusually resilient in this context or not. So we'll have to wait and see. And so lastly, I'd just like to thank all of the other collaborators that contributed to this work and have really done the hard work. So Juan Carlos Ortiz and Nick Wolf, he's now at Ames and Nick's at TNC. Carlo Hock, uh, Scott Condy at CSIRO, Kay Critchell, who's uh, just joined our lab, who's going to be downscaling some of these models to higher resolution using SLIM. Ken Anthony at Ames, Stephen Lewis, and Michelle Devlin on some of the water quality. Thank you.